Man, that was world record. I don't think I could have. Yeah. I was going to say, that was like eight minutes and 30 seconds, brother. That was like an Indy 500 exchange right there. Yeah, no, that's good. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, here we are. Acts chapter number 27 tonight. And you've got some handouts before you. And once again, those are yours. I hope that these last couple of lessons in the book of Acts will still be able to be stuffed into your binders. Um, we got some new binders coming as we get ready to start the book of Revelation. Um, so that'll come here real soon. So hopefully these will get in here. Uh, just a few more sheets. But Acts chapter number 27 is where we find ourselves today. Um, the title of today's message is Spiritual Shipwreck. And things that we ought to be aware of in terms of spiritual shipwreck. I'm already good to go. How'd you do that? <laughs> um, so uh, spiritual shipwreck and the things that we ought to be aware of. So we're going to read through Acts chapter 27. We're going to read through Paul's account and, and his experiences. Um, but we're also going to liken this unto some things that we ought to uh, take heed to. Um, every time we get into the Word of God, um, God has a specific purpose for us. He has something for us as we go there. And it may be something different for each one of us. A lot of times it is. So I know God will have something from you from the message today, so uh, be challenged in that way. So let's take a look here. Spiritual shipwreck, things to be aware of. And keep in mind, um, as we take a look here, you guys do have a copy of this map in your previous uh, pages that you can refer to. Um, but we take a look all the way over in here. We can find Jerusalem down in here. And you can see right here with this golden colored rod, maybe you can see it or not, um, this is Paul's journey to Rome. And we can see that starting way over here, um, down in this neck of the woods, way down over in here. Um, and uh, the traveling that we're going to read through is really going to take him through this maze and around these different areas. And so um, something to consider, um, and I'll point this out um, first and foremost, you know, as we take a look at his journey and as they leave, remember these ships that they're traveling in um, were not powered by steam engines. They weren't even powered by squirrels or any other kind of beasts at all. Um, they would, if they had prisoners on board, sometimes they would use the prisoners to row, um, but to have the prisoners rowing in, a, in an ocean environment is typically not very successful. The way that they normally go is um, by allowing the wind um, to be a part of their success in getting to their end destination. And so we're going to see what Paul goes through here in this traveling time. But, you know, as we, we take a look over into here, you know, the closer you stay to land, and normally the safer you are from those uh, deep sea storms that occur out in the ocean. And so you can see their journeys uh, begin to skirt around uh, inland uh, to begin. This here is the island of Cyprus. And that will be mentioned here, and we'll see as they make their way up and around that island of Cyprus, just like the Catalina Islands out here really protect the west coast, a good little segment of it from a lot of storms and a lot of storm surge and swells just because it's an island out there, and this does the same thing. And so they're going to make their traveling up here um, around this, and boy, they're real hesitant to get too far um, out into the ocean before they need to. They're heading up to Rome, remember? And so that's the end destination, and we'll go back and forth to this particular slide here just to give reference to where they are um, as they go through this journey. I'm going to be pointing out um, five different points for you tonight as we make our way through this chapter that you do not have illustrated in your slides that I gave you. So as you hear me mention these points, if you want to retain them deeply, you could jot them down on the pages that you have in front of you and as far as a note uh, goes. But I will have five points in regards to spiritual shipwreck as we're making our way through uh, this chapter. So Acts chapter number 27 and verse number 1. 
And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. And so uh, Paul, you remember, in the previous chapter, he was before King Agrippa, and he was before the new governor as well. And uh, remember, Paul made a, uh, a fast decree that he wanted to appeal unto Caesar. Jesus Christ told him he was going to Rome, and I think he was, he was all about getting there. He didn't want to waste a whole lot of time. And, and because he appealed there, you remember, the uh, very last uh, verse of chapter number 26 was King Agrippa um, talking about Paul could have very well been set at liberty if he would just held his peace and allowed the process of law to happen and have his, they found no wrong in him. They found no wrong for him to be put to death and no wrong for him to even be in bonds at all. And he would have been released. And that's what King Agrippa is referring to here. But with that being said, he's not been released because he appealed unto Caesar. And so he's still in custody as we come to this place right here in verse number one. And uh, so they, they find a ship that's going to be heading in that direction. And once again, um, it wasn't like uh, getting on a Carnival Cruise Line and ordering your tickets up and going to the port. Boy, they'd have to coordinate and figure out what ships are going where. And, and uh, this centurion was put in, far to the, in, in charge of these uh, prisoners here. You know who was said to be one of these prisoners, potentially? Luke. Dr. Luke. Amongst these uh, folks that are in here. I don't know, the Word of God doesn't tell us, but history uh, uh, tells us that. Um, so we have Julius, this centurion that's here, um, one of Augustus's bands, and they find a ship. Verse number two, and entering into a ship of Adratium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Articatus of Macedonia of Thessalonica being with us. And so you can see here in verse number two, that they had a course that they were planning on sailing. And almost right off the bat, um, the Bible says that uh, uh, they intended to go this way, but they ended up going a little bit of a different route. And, and you know, sometimes uh, back in this time, the weather people weren't as good as our weather people are here today. Our weather people are 100% accurate all the time, aren't they? <laughs> they're never right in Southern California unless it's a blue sky, which fortunately we have a blue sky quite a bit, right? Um, so their batting average is probably pretty good. But you know what? Um, to get on a ship and say we're going to Rome, uh, they're getting on a ship and going to Rome, uh, whether there's a storm coming or not. They've got uh, lading and whatnot, and they're going to do the best they can to hide along the way behind different items, uh, islands. A lot of these uh, ships would have different courses and different places. Um, I'll mention this place right here. The Bible is going to talk about it. Fair Havens. This is another island that they come on. They, they kind of hide from this storm there. And, and along this route to get here into Rome, um, they're going to do this pretty consistently. But I'll point out that they've already changed course, which means that most likely somebody heard that there was bad weather up ahead. Right? Would you agree? And so their course begins to change almost immediately out the gate. Verse number 3. And the next day... We touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And so you consider how good this centurion Julius must have been and how the Lord must have really impressed upon his heart to do something outside the nine dots. Paul's a prisoner. And there's a lot of other prisoners here. And you remember that Paul has a lot of relationships with a lot of people up and down this coastline, doesn't he? He's been here a few times, hasn't he? He's, he's spent the better part of his uh, uh, life as a saved man uh, trenching up and down the coastlines and inlands. And he knows a lot of people here. And this centurion here allows Paul to go. And I'll, I'll say this, God allows Paul to go and be refreshed. Things are going to get tough for him. Things are going to get hard for him. But God here in His miraculous intervention, I believe, speaks to the heart of this centurion, Julius, and uh, He allows him to go. I don't know how many other prisoners might have been complaining about that. You ever think about that? I bet they had to kind of calm down a little bit of ruckus going down below when, when Paul was asked to come up above. 
and then he's gone for some time, and he comes back with all the goodie bags and stuff. I don't know if he came back with goodie bags, but you know what I'm saying? This can stir up some things. A lot of these prisoners that are, that are here, they don't care who Paul is. He's just another prisoner. And a lot of these guys are, are being charged with heinous crimes. But Paul is allowed to go um, and take liberty to go into his friends and refresh himself. And boy, that speaks really loudly of how good it is to have some good people around us, isn't it? We can be refreshed by one another. We can not even understand what's going on in each other's lives and somebody may be at a moment where they just need someone to, to talk to and relate to and boy, God brings along the right thing from the Holy Spirit to have you say and man, you, you lift somebody up and you refresh them you don't even realize you did it. That's the amazing thing that God does within His house amongst His own believers. Verse number 4, And when He had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And so if we look back at our map here, they've already changed and we see Cyprus over here and man, they weren't sure what they were going to do. Things were, were changing, the storm was changing and, and now they're, they're getting ready and they're changing course again because the Bible says the winds are contrary, aren't they? Now, at this point, they've already been warned, haven't they? Somebody gave the weather report and said things are bad, we don't go this direction. And they alter their course and they leave and they go and they see things are getting worse in the way that they're going. And someone on board, probably the master of the ship, says, hey, I have a great idea. Uh, let's get over here and get under this particular island here and, and see what's going to happen next. And they do just that. <coughs> Verse number 5, And when we had sailed over the sea of Sicilia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy. And he put us thereon. Now, we can't tell for certain at this point, at least from Scripture, as to whether this centurion actually intended on remaining on this particular ship that was going to Rome and why he chose to change ships when they got to this port. But I mean, if you think about it from a, from a human perspective, he changed ships here. Why did he do that? Was it, did he lack confidence in the master of the other ship? Did that guy change courses too many times? Was it the centurion that was coming up with his own plan on how he was going to get there because he was afraid of the course that was going to be stayed by the first ship? The fact of the matter is that the centurion that's in charge of Paul and all the other prisoners decides to uh, get off of the original ship that they were on that was headed to Italy. And they now board the Alexandria, which was also sailing to Italy. And so they've changed ships at this time. Verse number 7, And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against uh, Nidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete, over against Salamone. Now listen, remember they're in sailboats, right? It's not a sailboat, it's a ship. It's a massive ship, but they're, they're being powered by the wind. And the wind is not allowing them to go the direction that they want to go. The storm is upon them, isn't it? Things have changed. The normal route that they might be able to take to be able to make this hop across to get around the, the islands there to Italy, um, the wind is preventing them from doing this. Verse number 8, And hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens. And this is, I love the name of this island right here. This is the Fair Havens. And they pulled up and they took refuge here. And I find it interesting on how this is called the Fair Havens. Boy, I bet it was a lot better here than it was trying to make way through a storm as they made their way to the other side of this island here, and they were able to uh, port that ship, if you will. And you know, they come to this place called Fair Havens, and it's a little bit of a refuge from their current circumstances, isn't it? And once again, Paul is here with all of these prisoners. I'm sure they're feeling a little uneasy knowing the journey that's ahead of them going all the way to Italy. I mean, this is a long trip. I'm going to ask any of you here, would anybody be brave enough in today's age to get on a first century ship? 
and make this travel all the way to Rome from Jerusalem? I know my brother over here would. Dan's like, yeah, I'd do that. I'd row it if we needed to. <laughs> Amen? I understand. Some people like being on that, and that's, that's awesome. You wouldn't find me there. I wouldn't take that trip. I'd say, send me a postcard, and we'll see. I'll watch the house for you and all that. Um, that's a long journey, isn't it? And these prisoners, they know what's ahead of them. They know where they're going. They're all going to Caesar's court. This is where they're headed to. Imagine the demeanor of those that are um, in charge of the prisoners. Do you think they're being kind to these people? These are the people that have already been passed on from court to court to court to court, and they're, they're going to the top dog, aren't they? These are normally these cases that are on appeal, if you will, and normally uh, the holdouts are those that are the most heinous. You wouldn't expect Christians to be on board here, would you? But there are some that are here on board. So they're here in Fair Havens. Verse number 8. The second part of verse 8 says, Nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. And so not only are they able to take refuge, I'm sure that they're able to disembark um, from there <coughs> for some time to kind of relax. And uh, for those experts in, in riding on ships and stuff, you, you may not worry about getting your sea legs off and getting your real legs back on, but it takes a little while after being on a ship, especially one that's being tossed to and fro. You're kind of longing for land, if you will. And so I'm sure that they've uh, disembarked here. A lot of the people have, have got off this uh, particular ship here in uh, Lycia. Verse number 9, "...in which when much time was spent..." And when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed. Now listen, they're on their way to Italy, right? They're leaving over here. They, they faced some, um, some turmoil and some storms as they were going. They, they changed course twice already. They got off one ship and, and got all the prisoners off and boarded the Alexandria to go yet again. And then the weather prevents them and they find themselves here in the Fair Havens. And it's almost like the master of the Alexandria has lost his sense of urgency, knowing that the season of storms is upon them. And he really knows what's going to take place out here after they leave. That's what I think. Scripture doesn't give us that. That's what I believe. Why else would he be lingering there? He's come out of a few different storms and he hasn't even hardly got away from landfall yet. And he spends a lot of time here. Listen, the Bible says in verse 9, now when much time was spent. They spent a lot of time here, didn't they? I think they spent more time than they should have because the Bible tells us that now sailing was dangerous. During this time of the year, they might have been able to squeak through that window of the big storms coming through if they would have just made way, but they really burned up a lot of time here on this island called Fair Havens. And you know, partly what I believe was going on, I think they were enjoying themselves. Not the prisoners, but the crew and the people that were manning this ship. How many times a year do you think they've got to make this trip? I don't even know. I, honestly, I can't tell you what the timeline should be uh, to be able to get there if everything was good for them. But these are sailors, aren't they? And man, they do this all the time. And I think they got a little comfortable here in this port of Fairhaven. Um, and they, they kind of hung out here a little bit longer than they should. And now sailing's becoming really dangerous for them. And so now that this happens, <laughs> the chief master of the Alexandria, Paul is going to say something, right? Is Paul, a, is Paul a sailor? He's a fisherman, huh? And he's going to stand up here and he's going to give some advice. Verse number 10, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading of the ship, but also of our lives. Paul is watching what's going on here. Paul's got a little bit of experience being on the water, doesn't he? I don't know that he's traveled and done fishing for crab out here and all that. I don't know about that. But Paul's offering his two cents. And you know what? I think Paul's two cents matters. You know why? Because he's connected to God, isn't he? The Holy Spirit dwells within him. And Paul gives this admonition to 
the folks of the ship here and says, man, this is, this is going to be painful for us if we continue to move forward. And, and, and he's probably going, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It's your ship. You do what you want. But I'm just saying this could be bad for us. And he's talking with Julius. It sounds like he's got a pretty good relationship with this centurion. To be able to speak openly like this. Especially when you're in a position of your life is on the line. And, and taking a ship like this out into a storm and, and traveling the seas can be very dangerous. And the people that are professionals at it, they don't take very lightly to those that are not professionals trying to say which way they ought to go and how they ought to handle things on their ship. But clearly Paul has a good relationship here with Julius and he brings this up and, and says, man, I think this is going to be bad if we, if we try and muscle through this and, and get out into the Mediterranean right now. Verse number 11. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. The master of the ship said, no, nah, we're not going to do it that way, Paul. We're going to, uh, we're going to move on and we're going to keep going just like uh, we've always done. In uh, fact, I've, uh, I've went to several men on board and we got this under control. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to be casting away and getting out of here. You ever been on a ship in a storm? Anybody? Did it make your hair stand up on the back of your neck? Was it, a, was it one of those storms? You're like, this boat, this boat may tip over, huh? Amen. You too, brother? Yeah. Wow. You know, there's nothing like being afraid when you're in the sea because you really feel helpless because the sea is so vast and rescue is so far away typically. And I can only imagine in the hearts and minds of those that are traveling on the ship, even the crew, that the air is a little thick, the atmosphere is a little bit tense around here as they're making this journey. They're, they're in the season when it is very dangerous to sail. But somebody that's on the other end, way up here in Italy, is saying, hey, we need our cargo here, and we need our prisoners brought back here, and don't let anything stop you. And so they're motivated by that. They've got a timeline to keep. And you know what? Even for those that ran these ships to fail to meet a timeline could mean your life, depending on who you were dealing with. Verse number 12, And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice um, and there to winter, which is the haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and the northwest. And so, now they're even considering changing what's going on even further because now more people are getting involved in putting in their two pennies into the conversation. The Bible says here that uh, these men went and they, they conferred with one another and they said, man, it is not commodious for us to stay here. It's not convenient. Uh, let's, let, let's try and move on a little bit further and see if we can get up into Crete. But you know what? Sometimes doing things that are convenient can be a little dangerous depending on what it is. And they're making their way here. Verse number 14. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. And when the ship was caught, they could not bear it up into the wind. We let her drive. You know, there's a time in a sailboat where the strength of a man and a pulley trying to control the sails and, and pull them back in a certain direction, there's, there comes a point in time where the power is unmatched by that which the wind has. And they just let the ropes go and they let the pulleys break, if you will, and, and the boat's just going to be driven wherever it's going to be taken by the wind. That's the safest course of action. 
You know, if you try to fight against the wind in a sailboat, if you've ever watched any videos about great captains of sailboats, the greatest try and hold that thing up in the wind, and you know what happens? It just throws the boat over. <laughs> the wind's too powerful. And so if you fight against the wind too much, you're really putting in jeopardy your whole entire vessel and everybody that's on board and the, the, the cargo that's there. And so they let go of everything and they let the wind drive. Verse 16, And running under a certain island which is called Claudia, or Clauda, uh, we had much work uh, to come by the boat. The boat was beat up as a result of this storm that they're in. It's getting wrecked here. They've, uh, they've been run aground, if you will. And they're kind of panicking a little bit. The Bible says in verse 17, uh, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands. They strake sail and so were driven. And so, man, they're trying to get a hold of landfall here, but things are not going well. And so uh, they pull up stakes again and they just let the wind uh, drive them into the sea. Verse 18, And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lighten the ship. And the third day we cast out our own hands the tackling of the ship. All the stuff that helps them to steer and guide the ship is now being thrown overboard to get rid of all the weight in the ship because their lives are on the line. The storm is out of control. There's no more hope for this group of men to physically control this vessel in the storm that they're in. And so they're chucking everything overboard. Imagine being on this ship. This must be complete chaos that's happening. Verse number 20, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. It had been days upon days upon days where the sun wasn't seen, the stars weren't seen, the moon wasn't seen. They were consumed in the midst of a storm. A storm like I'd never even considered being in. This thing lasting weeks and they're caught up in it. And you can think, well, you should be able to drive straight across the storm. Well, maybe if you've got an engine power in you and you stay the course. Remember, they couldn't hang. The power of the winds were well, far outmatched their power and they're letting this boat be driven around within the midst of this storm. Verse number 21, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. This is great. Paul already gave his two cents, didn't he? This is going to be dangerous if we continue on. Come on, what are we thinking here? Let's, let's, let's pack it up and hang out at Fair Havens for a little longer. I mean, what's it going to be a big deal? And of course, they're like, get out of here. You don't know what you're talking about. And now they're at the I told you so place. Because things are unraveling in a hurry. Remember, they've chucked almost everything other than themselves overboard thus far. And Paul, after long abstinence, the Bible says, makes an appearance. And he says, Sirs, verse number 21, ye should have hearkened unto me. Man, you should have listened to me. What's wrong with you all? This is great here, though. You should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. Something they picked up. You know, we don't consider this at times, but our actions could gain us some pain and some hurt. We always think about the things that we can gain from doing things in a profitable and a right way, but you know, if we do things in a wrong way, we can gain some things that will be undesirable as well. It would be a little painful. They could sting. Verse number 21. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. This is Paul's speech. I told you! But don't worry! Cheer up! Be happy! None of us are going to die that's here. Do you think they all smiled back at him and said, Yay, Paul! Thank you for telling us that! Man, they're probably ready to pull him limb from limb, aren't they? 
What do you mean I told you so? They're probably all looking at each other and who is this guy and this, this prisoner Paul and what do you mean I told you? And But the second part of this is big. Paul says our lives are going to be saved. And you know, a lot of times, people won't really look to the men and the women of God until they're in peril. And they're in a bad place. Being on a ship that looks like it's going to wreck and kill everybody is a pretty good situation to be in if you're a man or woman of God. Amen? People are going to start listening to Paul a little bit here. They're going to be tuned in a little bit to, to what he's saying here. He's going to explain what he's talking about in verse number 23. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. He declares right away that, you know what? One of God's messengers appeared to me last night, and this is the God that I belong to, and the God that I serve, and he's spoken to me. And this is what he said Don't worry, it's going to be okay. All of us are going to live. Listen to what he says, verse 24, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar. Remember, Jesus Christ himself told Paul he's going there. He needs him there. He's going to allow him to be his witness there in a place where no Christian has been to be able to be an open witness. And Paul was eager to take place and go ahead and go. And because of the company that Paul's keeping... These men's lives are going to be spared. Do you understand that? This really doesn't have a lot to do with any of these other people that are on this ship. It has everything to do with Paul. And God looks down and sees Paul on this ship. Jesus Christ sees his man uh, on his way to Rome. And he says, nah, th these people are going to survive this. This might be tough, but you know what? Paul, I told you, you're going to suffer great things for my name's sake. And here you go. I hope you got rested up at the previous port. Verse number 25, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Paul says, I'm very confident. God told me that we're all going to survive this, and you guys seriously need to cheer up because I believe what my God says. You know, sometimes when we get on that soapbox as Christians and we just kind of tell people, come on, man, get a grip on yourself. Who is God? Who is He? He's the creator of this universe, isn't He? Man, I'm going to beat up on myself because of my own sin. Was Jesus' price that He paid on the cross not enough for you? You've got to wallow in it more and more? We shouldn't take that from Him. He's paid it all, hasn't He? And they're listening to the man of God here and Paul is telling them that he belongs to the Lord and he believes exactly what he said. Verse number 26, How be it, we must be cast upon a certain island. Kind of like those serpents, those fiery serpents that were biting the people there in the book of Numbers chapter 21 where they wanted the serpents to be taken completely away. And God said, no, Moses, go ahead and put that brazen serpent upon the, the staff and they'll, when they get bit, they can look and they'll live, right? Serpents weren't taken away. The people still got bit. I bet that was painful, wasn't it? But all they had to do was look, right? And God, although He's going to spare all these souls that are aboard the Alexandria here um, out in the Mediterranean Sea, um, it's going to come at a little bit of a price. They're going to be cast out on a certain island. That means they're going to be dislodged from this ship that they're on. Verse number 27, but when the 14th night was come, 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. Someone up on top that was brave enough to be up there with his little uh, periscope said, eh, land, land, I think I see something this way and we're, we're headed in that direction. Verse 28, and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again in 15 fathoms. And fearing lest we should have fallen upon the rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. The bottom of the sea was coming up fast. You with them? They did see land. You know, if you know anybody, well, brother, 
You cast four anchors out of the bag, that's an emergency, amen? That's a, we need the brakes on right now. That's everything they have. They're tossing it out. The Bible says, and they wish for the day. Well, Lord, you've got to be in control. And I'll say this. Even in the midst of all of this, the ship being tossed to and fro, you remember back in verse number 15, they had to let the ship drive. They had to let God send that ship where He wanted to. And all of a sudden, it's headed for land. And they get to this place where they're drawing near and near and near and Man, they see the, the anchors, the, the shore coming and the anchors go out and oh what do you think is gonna happen? They're all gonna die? They're not all gonna die, are they? Verse number 30. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the uh, boat into the sea uh, under color as they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Here Paul is again, the man of God, giving commands as everybody is trying to go overboard. Now, I've never been on a ship, military speaking, to understand what the call is to go overboard and what point you got to get past before you tell everybody to get off. But Paul's saying, the call's been made to get off, and he's saying, no, don't get off the ship. If you get off, you're going to drown, you're going to die, you're not going to be saved. So who are they going to listen to? Are they going to listen to the master of the ship? The centurion that's barking out the orders? All the men that are guarding the soldiers that are so eager to just take their heads off because things are unraveling. You know what the rule is? If, if, a, if this boat crashes, you know what they're supposed to do, the soldiers? Kill all the prisoners. They don't want one to escape. It's a very tense moment right now. Verse number 32. Then the su- soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. They're following Paul's direction. It's amazing to see what's happening here. Verse 33, And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat. Paul's trying to get everybody to eat. I've I've been on some boats before. I don't know how big they got to be before you call them a ship. I probably haven't been on a ship, but I've been on some boats. The last boat that I went on has influenced me greatly as to why I will never go back on a boat again. My dad had a boat when I was a kid, a little, like, you know, 26 footer or something that he used to, we used to go to Catalina, he used to hunt sharks on this thing, and we did crazy things as a young kid, but you know what? <laughs> Sometimes rides on these ships don't go so very well, especially if it's tumultuous weather. I don't know how many sailors even don't like that. Those that are hanging on the boat all the time, they don't like that on the ship. No way. And so all the men are about to flee out of the boat and Paul takes over and gives some direction and they're following. And Paul's trying to get them to eat. And man, if you've been on a ship for a long time in a bad circumstance, man, you don't want to eat anything. Nothing. Nothing. I remember my brother took me sea fe- uh, sea- deep sea fishing one time, my neighbor, brother in Christ. And I'd been on, a, I'd been on boats many times. And this was the last one I went on. Come on, brother, we'll go all day charter. We'll have fun. We'll get a lot of fish. And it was a rough day. And me, man, I've been on a boat before. They're like, it's 10-foot swells, and they're telling everybody to get underneath because it's rough. Where do you think, where do you think pastor's at? You guys know me well enough already. They're saying, get underneath. Where do you think pastor's at? I'm on the front. <laughs> woo With my brother next to me. And then after, I don't know how long of that, a half hour, man. Come on, brother, let's go get something to eat. And we go down there and we get some sloppy burger out of the most greasy kitchen I've ever seen on this little ragtag ship. And I'll tell you what, I never got back up again for the whole entire rest of the charter. I cast my pole in and I caught one fish and said, I got to go lay down, brother. You don't want to eat. My brother came over. We made it home. My eyes were closed the whole way from Long Beach all the way back to Pomona. 
eyes closed, walking in the house, in the bed. My, my poor brother Tony goes next door and he cleans all the fish because he had a good fishing day. He actually fished. It's like 10.30 at night. My brother's bringing over some fish for me in bed at my house. And what do you think my response was? Get that fish out of my face. <laughs> thank you, but no thank you, brother. Get it out of my house, please, right away. <laughs> And Paul's trying to get these folks to eat. He says, hey, don't worry. We're all going to be safe. Come on. We've got we to eat some food. Verse 33. He says, this day is the 14th day since you have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. <clears throat> I'd be taking nothing too, wouldn't you? Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. Paul's saying, you know what? You've got to strengthen yourself. We know you don't feel good. We know it's been a little stressful out here, but God said He's going to save us all. Let's sit down and have a banquet. Come on. we got to eat. He goes on to say, For there shall not an hair fall from your head of any of you. Paul's confident. He's like, come on, it's already settled. Remember the angel of God came and talked to me and said it's good. We're all going to be saved. Let's have a hot meal before we're spit overboard. That proves Paul's a Baptist, right? <laughs> he likes to eat. But you know what? Paul was working in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? There's no other way you can do things like this. Verse 35, And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. God, Paul's here being a witness, isn't he? He's thanking God for what's gone on so far and thanking Him for this little bit of bread that they have that they're about to eat. And when he had taken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. You know, sometimes it takes one of us to just stand out in front of the crowd and say, this is the way we're going. And then all of a sudden, a bunch of people following you when nobody was following initially. Sometimes that's what we have to do as believers. That's sometimes what we have to do to influence others around us. Take a stand for the Lord where nobody else would even consider doing such a thing. Verse number 37, and we were in all, I'm sorry, and we were in all in the ship 203 score and 16 souls. That's a lot of people. And God spared every one of them. And their bodies literally could have been strewn across the, street, the sea from Jerusalem all the way out into the Mediterranean Sea. But God spared them. I want us to consider some things, these five points that I want to talk in closing tonight. We see this journey that Paul was on here without taking away the dramatic effect of really finishing this story up well and knowing that, you know what, they let this boat go in the way that the wind was going to drive it and boy, it, it ran up, the Bible says, in the way where two seas met together, these currents came together and drove this ship right up safely onto the land. Now the Bible says that the back half of the ship was beaten off because of the waves were so fierce. It was a storm. And this ship was broken into pieces. But the souls that were on board made it safely to land. And I bet there was a great love that was screamed out from within each one of these men and women that were saved on this ship. The people that were keeping the prisoners were going to kill all the prisoners when this ship ran aground and all of a sudden the ship broke open and all chaos is going and they're afraid that prisoners are going to swim away and that's customary to happen. Paul should have very literally lost his life again in this wreck right here in itself. They have enough on their hands. They'll kill all the prisoners and be done with it. And it'll be okay with their government. But yet God spared all of these people here in a miraculous way. And it wasn't like the ship was just run aground and then they got off on dry land. They're not like they're on some cruise ship or something. Listen what the Bible says in verse 42. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose. 
and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on, broken, uh, some on board, some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they all escaped all safe to land. Every one of them. But it was a little treacherous, wasn't it? We consider what was going on here in these areas that we should consider as we are thinking about spiritual shipwreck and applying it to the Scriptures that we can see here. You know, the master of the ships here, they did something um, that was very wrong to do. They disregarded obvious warning signs. It was very clear that things were bad. But they disregarded obvious warning signs. Do we do that in our life? I mean, these are the things that we need to be aware of so that we are not shipwrecked spiritually. We cannot disregard obvious warning signs. We can't do it. You know, based on uh, the preaching of the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will convict each one of us at different times as we hear messages preached. Our job is to respond to that Holy Spirit speaking to us and to do something about it. We can't go on disregarding obvious warning signs. You know, as they went on and they changed course and then they changed course yet again and then they changed ships, a lot of times as we uh, are viewing life and our circumstances, we'll think that we can come up with our own plan and everything's going to be okay. And we forget about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, tells us not to lean unto our own understanding. But trust God. Amen? Allow Him to direct our paths. Allow Him to drive us in the direction just as if we were a ship taking our hands and our feet off of the controls of the ship and saying, God, you've got to take me where you want me to go. But we cannot come up with our own plan and think it's going to supersede God's plan for our life. You know, they landed in this place, Fair Havens, in verse number 8 of Acts chapter number 27. And boy, they spent their time there. And it was dangerous by the time they got ready to leave. Sailing was not good anymore. They delayed to take proper action. They delayed to take proper action. You remember, they were making their way to Italy. And these storms are coming up and they're changing course. And boy, they land in Fair Havens and they must have been relaxed and having a good time because it caused them to hang out for a little bit there, didn't it? As Christians in our lives, we should never delay in taking the proper action as the Holy Spirit speaks to us through those obvious warning signs. We see the obvious warning signs that He speaks to us on. That's the moment where you say, I cannot come up with my own plan here. The Holy Spirit has spoken to me and I want to allow God to do what He's going to do and I don't want to delay to take the proper action. Delaying and taking the proper action put these men's lives in harm's way. God had to intervene miraculously to save these men's lives. Otherwise, they would have been all dead because they delayed to take the proper action. Do you remember after they, they left there, um, verse number 12 reminds us that they went and they, they felt that it wasn't commodious to uh, be there wintering in the havens. And so uh, they talked with all the other folks around and boy, they came up with a consensus that hey, we, need to, we just need to press on. Don't, don't worry about what the weather people are saying. We just need to press on and, and, and we'll get there. And we'll see what the end result was, right? Shipwreck. They got counsel from the wrong people. They'd have been looking to the man or woman of God. Instead, they were looking to all these people that they call the experts in the field. Well, you've been a deckhand for 30 years. What do you think? They talked to a bunch of people, but I'll tell you this. They got counsel from the wrong people. They got counsel from ungodly people. Led them astray. Remember, Paul said, much damage is going to come. We can't keep doing this. Come on. God was speaking. And you remember as they chose to leave there once again and they realized it wasn't commodious to winter in this particular bay here in the Havens. You know, they were really looking for something that was going to be convenient for them. 
something that was going to work out. And like I said earlier, we can't always look for doing things that are going to be easy and convenient. The standard has to be, I need to do what's right. You consider it in the eyes and the face of these sailors here, if they would have really done what was right as sailors, knowing the open and obvious warning signs that there's storms on the horizon that are bad, they're already getting inland, an experienced, well thought through uh, sailor would have said, we can't go. But they powered through that. Once again, I'll remind you, point number one, don't disregard obvious warning signs. Two, do not come up with your own plan. Three, don't delay in taking the proper action when the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Four, make sure you're getting counsel from good people, not ungodly people and others that are out there writing books and stuff. And don't do that which is convenient, but do that which is right. Paul's a great example here, enduring through this storm and going through this. This is, I would have been praying for God to kill me because I'd have been so sick physically. And I know most all of these men and women that were on the ship were physically sick. That's why they weren't eating. Nobody, everybody was probably green in the gills, wishing and hoping. But you know what? God's man Paul came through, didn't he? And he was the spokesman, and he stood up in the midst of the storm and said, don't worry, God's told me, and I believe him. You know what? When the Holy Spirit speaks to you when you hear a message, when you're reading the Scripture, the Word of God, don't deny what the Holy Spirit is telling you. God is always right. Just take immediate action. We'll find ourselves in the best place if we do that. Beware of spiritual shipwreck. Let's pray. Father, you are so very good to us. We thank you for your love and your mercy, your long-suffering. We pray that you would just help us, Lord, as we go through this week to uh, beware of these potential pitfalls, that we would really be open to listening to the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit, that you would direct our paths, Lord, in a clear way so that we would understand the very next step we ought to take. We love you so very much for allowing us to study your word and for being encouraged by it. We thank you for the truth of your word and the preservation of it as well. Be with us this week, Lord. Help us to be the light in our community, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.